Good morning. I was uh, curious how many people would come along to this session because IoT is still quite a, I wouldn't say a niche, but still quite a specialist subject. There aren't actually, of the total number of developers that are out there, there aren't actually that many de developers working in the IoT domain. And then InfoSec in IoT is like a niche of a niche, so relatively small subset of people. But you guys obviously in that tiny little intersection of those two Venn diagrams that overlap with each other. So thanks for coming to the session. And my name's Ian. I lead technology evangelism for AWS in Europe, Middle East and Africa region. So we're all about trying to help developers become productive in use of AWS services. Uh, probably the first question you're asking yourself is why is somebody from, from Amazon Web Services up here talking about IoT? What do we have to do with IoT? Well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, uh, AWS customers have been using the AWS cloud to build connected device applications for a long time. Uh, three good examples of that would be Tile. Do you know about Tile? Have you seen them? Do you know what they are? I have one in my, my bag, I think I'll show you. So they've got a little Bluetooth low energy tracking token that you can attach to a device like a set of keys or a motorcycle or a piece of luggage. And then that pairs up with a Bluetooth uh, receiver app that goes on your phone. And you can find your device anywhere in the world. It will record the last known location of the, of the item that the, the, the tile is attached to. That's how they started. They've extended that now and you can actually buy uh, luggage, other items of equipment that already have tile tokens pre-embedded within them, so they're like part of the construction of the product, and they provide a value-added service to other manufacturers that want to track their, allow their customers to track their items anywhere in the world. So that's built on AWS. Then we've got Sonos, which a lot of you will be more familiar with, I'm sure, the, the connected uh, audio product, and we also have regulated examples. So uh, Philips Healthcare I was a little bit surprised in the keynote actually when the keynote speaker was talking about difficulties with managing compliance in the cloud. Uh, Philips Healthcare started connecting their medical imaging devices to AWS about three years ago. And if you go into a hospital in North America now and have an X-ray or a CAT scan, there's a good chance that the data from that scan scanning activity will be stored on AWS. They directly attach their attach connect their devices to the cloud using our secure APIs and they stream their imaging data straight out of their X-ray systems directly into AWS. And then we protect that with HIPAA compliant information security controls to make sure that only authorized clinicians can access that imaging data and see it's part of your EPR, your electronic patient record. So customers using AWS services to build stuff like that for a long time. And then in 2015 at AWS reInvent, actually more or less this time last year, we, we announced a specific service for IoT, which is a, a managed platform for building IoT apps. So this is a AWS IoT. I'm going to return and talk a little bit about that later on. But basically, the intent really was just to simplify down the ingress and device management process for developers that wanted to connect low-powered and lightweight connected devices to the cloud in order to build applications of this type in the future. So we've got some service components that are intended, intended to simplify that. We're going to talk about that later, uh, really only in the context of how we've implemented some of the guidance that I'm going to give you now about how to secure this kind of app. So everything that I'm going to talk about from now on, you could build yourself using your own engineering skills, assembling components, or you could use managed services like, like AWS to, uh, to deliver. So uh, security and the Internet of Things. When I was asked to do this talk, I, I was thinking to myself, how am I going to contextualize this? How am I going to make this, this topic area real for the audience? And then, fortunately, uh, this happened like two weeks ago. Okay, so now I don't have a problem. Everybody knows about security, uh, IoT security. You know about this, right? This is the attack on DIN, on the global DNS service provider DIN, uh, described in the press as uh, yellow pages for the internet, which I thought was quite a good, uh, good articulation of what DNS is. But of course, what happened here is, uh, some bad guys hijacked a lot of connected device infrastructure. And they used that as a botnet to deliver an attack pattern against a critical piece of internet infrastructure. And it actually had a big input on, uh, impact on some of the largest servers, services on the internet. So there's no need really for me to try and paint a picture of what the potential risks are if you are building connected device applications and you, you don't take care of security. Uh, bad things can happen. Okay, and we'll return to precisely how those bad things can happen can happen later. So much so that it's become a joke now. So you know, 
uh, wire my hacker $100 or I'll reverse my motor and blow dirt all over this place, or excuse us while we participate in a DDoS attack. So, you know, it's a, a, a now a meme in its own right. The internet of ransomware things is the title of this, this cartoon. It's kind of nice. So how does something like that happen? How can an attacker take control of a large number of connected devices in order to use them to, to stage an attack or, or to do other things? Well, in theory, everything's safe, right? Bob lives behind a firewall, and Bob is safe. Bob has a stapler, and Bob wants to know what's happening with his stapler, so he has a video camera that he uses for monitoring his stapler. Uh, and Bob has a browser-based app that allows him to connect to his video camera and see whether his significant other has moved his stapler. Make sense with me? Uh, now, Bob wants to go out okay, of his house, but he still wants to monitor the status of his stapler. So he gets the instruction book for his IP camera, and in his instruction book, it tells him to find the address of his IP camera on his local network, and then make a change to his firewall. Okay? And when he does that, he exposes his local camera, which is on his local network, to the internet. It's called port forwarding. You guys will know all about it if you're in InfoSec. So what's he done there? Well, he's made it possible for him to go out onto the internet with his phone, forget about all this stuff behind his firewall, and he can now access his camera and make sure that his stapler is safe while he's out in the world. Okay? But he's made a critical mistake here, hasn't he? He's exposed that device to other people, to bad guys that might be out, out there. Those bad guys are equipped with helpful tools like Shodan.io. This is a tool for searching uh, for patterns on connected devices. So you can, uh, it, you can look for, uh, for webcams that are inappropriately secured. You can look for, for DVRs or PVRs that might be exposed publicly. You can look for all sorts of infrastructure which has default security settings where the admin password is password and the admin username is admin. Okay. And you can take that and you can, of course, automate that process. So this is your control system. And then you can take control of, of Bob's camera. Uh, and if there's an application vulnerability on Bob's camera, uh, you can own it, you can run software on it, you can view Bob's stapler, you can do whatever you want because he's exposed that device to the public internet and the attackers can access it in exactly the same way that he can. Okay, so if that device is not secure, they can take advantage of vulnerabilities and uh, they can do things with those vulnerabilities. Now, the problem is, you know, there's not just Bob. This is how I explain to my kids where botnets come from, by the way, when they ask me that question. So, Daddy, where do botnets come from? They come from uh, individuals wanting to achieve certain outcomes and following simple instructions that have been given to them by people that unfortunately choose not to adequately maintain those connected devices. They don't adequately maintain the software that's on them. Uh, and the result of that is uh, you can get access to large fleets of connected devices which are inadequately sec secured. Okay, So that's really, in simple terms, the main problem with, with IoT security. Of course, it doesn't have to be like that. There are other ways that you can build applications like that. So. Here's the, the right way to do it. Everything looks the same. Uh, Bob can still view his camera on his local network, and he still uses that address to do so. But when he goes out onto the web, onto the internet, and takes his mobile, doesn't communicate directly with the camera. Uh, he has to communicate with a control plane, which is presented as a set of services. And that control plane well, the camera communicates with the control plane, so the camera only ever communicates outbound. There are no inbound connections that go through the firewall back to the device. Okay, this is the correct pattern to use for building this kind of application. What's the difference between this and the other pattern from the device manufacturer's perspective? Well, you have to run this control plane infrastructure. The device manufacturer has to be responsible for that. And obviously, there's a cost associated, associated with that. So if your objective is to deliver very, very low cost devices, and maybe your only revenue model is to sell those devices to customers, and you get a one-off payment each time they buy one, probably as a device manufacturer, you're not highly motivated to engage in best practices. You're not motivated to build applications that are secure. You're motivated to build applications that have the lowest cost profile. And, and the way to do that, of course, is not to have the control plane, but simply to expose the device directly to the internet and allow that direct control. 
Okay. So that's a little bit about, in very, very simple terms, why these issues arise and also what the ideal architecture is to avoid them. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit more now about this just to give you a little bit more flavor. So uh, now the camera and, and this particular attack pattern where the camera or, or rather a fleet of mixed devices, some of which were cameras, <laughs> is used to launch an attack is actually atypical for connected device applications. Okay? Most of the connected device applications that we engage with customers to help them build are much more lightweight. The, the devices themselves aren't fully featured machines that run operating systems and web servers. They are much more lightweight in nature. Okay? They're constrained, really, and microcontrollers uh, and very small ARM CPUs are very common in this particular use case. Okay? So you often don't have much power on the device. You're also working in constrained environments, and those constrained environments uh, can be constrained in quite a few different ways, actually. I'll give you an example. We have one customer called Telenor Connection. You'll know them, the, the IoT business unit of Telenor, which is the former state operator in Norway. And they provide uh, industrial and agricultural IoT solutions. One of their products enables farmers to connect livestock to the internet. So the sheep or cows wear a collar, a little bit like an agricultural version of a Fitbit. The collar has a temperature sensor and an RFID locator in it. Uh, the temperature sensor is used to provide periodic updates about the health of the animal. So is the animal abnormally hot? And if it is, they'll send out a vet. The veterinary will go out into the herd of animals. He'll take an RFID locator with him. And when he gets close to the animal with the right serial number, the detector will ping, so he can find the affected animal in the large herd of animals and he can treat it. There's quite a lot of constraints here. The, uh, the collars themselves need to be weatherproof, so you don't want to be tampering with them, right? Which means you don't want to have to open them up frequently, because if you do, you'll probably break the waterproofing. Which means you want them to be low power, so you can leave them out in the field for a long period of time without having to... Uh, retrieve them and replace them or, or, or update the power supply in them. Because they're low power, uh, this means that they have to have very small CPUs and very lightweight radios in them. So this means that they use line of sight radio systems which are deployed on buildings around the farm, so around the farm infrastructure, and that's how they get the data off the animals to a gateway and then send that data to the cloud to the, the endpoints that they use to build that service. So there's quite a lot of constraints in that environment. Very small CPUs, very uh, limited radio capability, but the benefit of that is the devices are automatically behind a gateway, so the devices themselves don't have any IP connectivity. They don't communicate with IP from the device to the radio. They communicate with a proprietary radio protocol, and the radio gateway then packages up the data packets into an IP packet with the right format and sends them off, off to the endpoint. So these constraints can also actually be beneficial from a security perspective. Those endpoints cannot be attacked. The gateway could be attacked, but the endpoints themselves cannot be attacked by an attacker. There's no way for them to get to them. Uh, remote locations, variable physical security. Already I've talked about quite a few different segments, haven't I? Uh, and I guess some of these segments are just not attractive to an attacker. That, that agricultural example that I've just talked about there, it's not attractive to an attacker. There's no value in getting access to that data. And there's really very little for an attacker to take control of and make use of for their own purposes, just that gateway endpoint which might be exposed. So you can also uh, do some threat model elimination here and work out which areas of, of your application may and may not be interesting to people that want to attack it. Also, you've got variable criticality, of course, as well. And I've already hinted there that the first step towards building uh, these kind of applications is to think about threat models. So commonly applied threat models like Stride is one. So this is a model that was developed by Microsoft. It involves looking at areas such as spoofing, tampering risk, repudiation or change risk, uh, information disclosure, so what's the potential risk of a privacy breach or data leak, and then issues such as denial of service or elevation of privileges. And you can use an assessment of the same type with an IoT application just as you might do with any other type of app. Okay? Uh, and when thinking about uh, these assessments, you need to do some of the stuff that I've just described. So think about how attractive this particular application or service is to attackers. 
think about what the potential uh, probabilities and the consequences of bad things happening might be. So if someone hijacks my agricultural system, what are the consequences? Well, I may find out la later than I want that some of my sheep are ill, and maybe they'll die. Okay? If somebody hijacks uh, even that medical system that I was talking about earlier, if someone was able to circumvent that, they might get access to, to, to patients' EPRs, their electronic patient records, there's a regulator which oversees the protection of that data. The care provider could be hit with quite a heavy fine and reputational damage as a result of that information leaking or it being, being disclosed that that information had been obtained by a third party. So you need to consider these kind of issues uh, when you're thinking about information security and application security for IoT apps, okay, just as you would do for, for any other kind of application that you build. Of course, there's another component here, which is to do with, with safety. So we're talking about things. Uh, things aren't some sort of abstract logical construct that exists only within software. They're physical devices, uh, and they can have physical consequences in the real world. I was looking for more source material last night, and I heard about uh, an apartment complex in Finland where a building management system had been attacked. Okay? And the implications of that were that they couldn't heat or cool the building for a 48-hour period. Now, probably, it's a Western country, okay, probably those people have got other alternatives that they can go to for heating, but it's still a pretty cold place to be at this time of year. Okay, it's just one example of a pretty low-end spectrum, continuum of different consequences that might occur if somebody is able to take control of physical devices or affect the operation of physical devices. And then we get into more safety critical systems like self-driving cars, industrial control systems, large-scale transportation operations that we might want to automate. So there's a lot of safety factors here. And essentially what can happen if the system is not adequately protected is uh, you can have bad guys that take control of endpoints, maybe injecting malicious data into the system, and that can cause really bad things to happen in the real world. So there are definitely, definitely threats that need to be considered here. So, main part of the talk, how can we defend against these? You know, what sort of steps can we take architecturally and with technical controls to prevent some of these things happening that I've talked about? And these are the three broad areas that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about secure communication with things. How do we prevent tampering? How do we protect regulated or valuable data that might be flowing from things to our service endpoints and do that in a way which prevents tampering, pre prevents eavesdropping, and prevents repudiation? Uh, we're going to talk about identity. How do we know what we're communicating with? How do we know that the entity or principle that we're communicating with is the intended endpoint for our traffic that we're going to send to it. And then we're going to talk about uh, fine-grained authorization. So we want to gather data from our things for an analytics or for visualization. We want to control or take actions or change state of our devices. So how do we ensure that the logic that drives those activities, drives that persistent storage of data, drives those uh, state changes, is itself protected and we're able to interface with the back end of this infrastructure in a, in a way which is trusted and secure. And then lastly, how do we go about building services? So first thing we're going to look at is, is secure communications. And this isn't a, a context or an environment where unidirectional uni security is acceptable. Okay, so for traditional TLS SSL, so we're communicating with websites, let's say. Uh, let's say we're a retailer, let's say we're Amazon. Is it important for us to digitally verify the identity of people that connect to our services? We're gonna identity, verify that identity in another way. We're gonna verify that identity through email verification, and we're gonna verify their identity through the most important way for us, before we ship any inventory to them, we're going to take payment, aren't we? Okay. So we have verification of identity that takes place above the transport layer. In the case of actually most web applications, we have verification of identity that takes place above the transport layer. But if I'm a customer, say I'm dropping onto Amazon.com to buy, my, this week I bought my kids some paper. They do a lot of drawing, so I'm buying paper on Amazon.com. Uh, is it important to me 
that I'm giving my credit card details and my personal data to someone whose ver identity that I can verify. Of course it is. So in this model, you have unidirectional identity proof, okay? And of course, the way we do that is with digital certificates, okay? So a digital certificate contains uh, two things. It contains, well, three things actually. An identity statement, so who is the principal, who is the entity that I'm connecting to. It contains their public key, okay? So, so that I can encrypt data with that key and send it to them, and then they can use uh, asymmetric keys to decrypt that data and read it. And it also includes uh, cryptographic proof that they hold the private key and that their identity has been verified. This is what a certificate authority does, a CA. Okay, so they will sign that digital certificate, verifying ID of the party that holds the certificate, and also uh, through a cryptographic proof, verifying that the party holds both the public and private key out of that key pair. Okay, so that's what this is. Who knows what happens for keys over here with TLS SSL? Anybody know what happens? When I connect, I don't have a key, do I? So how do I get a public and private key pair to enable me to secure communications across this channel? Anyone know? Yeah. The root keys on your, on your machine? No, you have session keys, actually. So each time you connect to a new website or establish a new session to a website, you generate randomly at that point a public-private key pair, which is good for that one session. Okay? And at the end of that session, those keys are discarded. Okay? And then when you restart the next session, you do the same thing again, you generate a session key for that particular session. Because he, he doesn't care who I am. All he cares, I just send my public key across using this public key to encrypt it, so it goes across encrypted. He decrypts it with his private key and then for data that he sends back, he uses that public key to encrypt traffic and I hold my private key, never disclosing it, and I can decrypt the traffic when it comes back to my browser. That's how the flow works. In, uh, in TLS SSL. And actually, that's why uh, CDNs, content distribution networks, and distributed endpoints offer such a performance increment for cryptographically protected traffic. The process of doing the session setup and the key generation and key exchange actually involves quite a lot of transactions. It involves about 20 transactions backwards and forwards to establish this secure link in this model. So it's intensive in terms of computational activity on the client because I have to generate the keys. It's also intensive in terms of network traffic because I'm handshaking and then I'm exchanging the keys and finally after those 20 transactions we can start to send traffic in a secure way. Okay, this is why content distribution networks like our CloudFront and other content distribution networks offer such a performance boost for encrypted traffic because they take that negotiation and move it much nearer to the client. They reduce latency. And if you're cutting 10 milliseconds off 20 transactions, you've taken a fifth of a second off the session setup time. Okay? So it's a web-related topic, but it's important that you understand how this works. It's not good enough for IoT. Okay? The reason that it's not good enough for IoT is twofold. First of all, we talked about constrained environments, and I just talked about session key setup and how computationally intensive it was. Computation costs battery, okay? So if I've got my lightweight sealed IoT device, I don't want to be randomly generating long cryptographic keys each time I need to perform a connection, okay? Because each time I do that, I'm running the CPU on my device to do so, and as I run the CPU for that activity, I'm burning battery, okay? So I want to have keys that are Static, that only I have, but I don't have to regenerate each time I make a connection, okay? And it's also important that the identity of the connecting device is known, okay? Otherwise, I can spoof, potentially spoof my identity, okay? Or even connect anonymously to a service endpoint. Uh, this could be dangerous, okay? Uh, I could send a piece of medical imaging data that was purported to be about a patient that it wasn't actually about because I could forge a connection from an untrusted endpoint injecting data into the service uh, and I could potentially, by doing that, subvert the logic in the service and have significant impact, right? So I need to know who is connecting to my service. So with mutual TLS auth, we have over here another digital certificate this digital certificate is uniquely associated with the device, okay? And we have a pre-generated public key and private key, okay, which are placed onto the device and once again, ideally unique to the device, okay? So, uh, when I make a connection request, the gateway endpoint 
can verify my identity, so it knows who I am. Okay? It can associate a policy with that identity, permitting or allowing me to do certain things in the platform that are linked to the principle associated with this digital certificate. And also, I have no key generation activity out here. I can immediately encrypt data using this public key, and this guy can immediately encrypt data using this public key and send it back to me. I will decrypt it using my private key, but there's never been key generation or key exchange activity. So it's much more computationally efficient, and it uses much less network bandwidth as well. OK, all make sense? Good. So we want that model. We don't want that model for, for IoT. Now, a public key cryptography options. Uh, asymmetric keys, which is what we're talking about here. There are two different uh, broadly supported options for asymmetric keys. One of them is the RSA key pair, which you'll be familiar with if you use SSH. RSA key pair generation, if you're using uh, SSH to connect to machines, is very common. Note that these keys are quite long, okay? And length of the key is correlated with the CPU overhead, the CPU cycles that are required to perform cryptographic operations using that key. The longer the key, the more CPU horsepower is required to encrypt data, okay? Symmetric keys, where you use the same key for encrypt and decrypt, they're much, much shorter, and they have a much lower computational overhead for encrypting data using them, okay? But that's no good for our model, because we want to have PKI, we want to have public key infrastructure. We don't want to be able to, we don't want to use symmetric keys in this model. We want to use asymmetric keys. So, there's another option which is called ECC, or elliptical curve cryptography. It's an alternative algorithm, an alternative set of ciphers that are available for a public key crypto provides a similar outcome to RSA, where we each have our public and private keys, and we can only decrypt data where we hold the private key corresponding to the public key that's been used to encrypt it. But the key size is much smaller. And you'll see here, you can, uh, for a 2048 RSA key, you only need 224 bits on an ECC key for the equivalent level of crypto strength. Okay, so it's much more lightweight for encryption and decryption operations. And if you can build this into your IoT client applications, you're going to find it much more battery efficient as a result of that. Okay, so tend towards elliptical curve cryptography and uh, tend towards the shorter key lengths that that provides if those are available to you and you can build them into your applications and software. Okay? Uh, we support this in our service. There's a blog there which describes actually some detail not only about uh, what the benefits are, but also a walkthrough of how to do key generation for ECC using OpenSSL. So if you are interested in experimenting with elliptical curve crypto, it's actually quite a good primer to, uh, to help you get started with that. Okay? So that's on the device side. Uh, okay? But of course, the vast majority of IoT applications don't consist solely of machines talking to machines. We want to have human beings that can either extract data or analytics and insights from the data that we're getting from our fleet of devices. And in a lot of cases, uh, we want to be able to do stuff. You know, I want to be able to make my uh, tile ring so that I can find my keys if they're in a general area but I can't find them. I want to be able to control the temperature on my hive or nest thermostat from my phone, right? I want to be able to do something with these devices. So we also have to be able to communicate with non-things. We have to be able to communicate with, with wetware, with, with human beings, right? So how do we do that? We implement that uh, through another set of APIs, which I'm going to talk about later, okay? And over here, we are using the uh, concepts that I talked about. It's much less battery constrained, power constrained, CPU constrained. We're also much more likely to be able to use the human being's external identity sources. So maybe I want to build an app where and I authenticate a human with an identity that they already own. So their Facebook, their Twitter, their Google ID, maybe username and password sign in, which is much easier to, for humans to deal with than the digital certificates. Maybe want to associate those kinds of identities with a set of permissions within an IoT application that gives a human the ability to control a particular subset of devices. Okay? The way we implement that is with another AWS service called Amazon Cognito, uh, which allows you to bring in public ID sources, match those up against cryptographic credentials that give permissions to operate with particular services that we provide, 
and then in future maintain that relationship. So whenever I log in with Twitter or with my Facebook ID, I get the same identity within AWS that allows me to operate on a certain set of resources. You could implement something yourself, yourself the same, of course. We're talking about Open ID Connect. We're talking about SAML. We're talking about running your own identity provider. And then we're talking about issuing policies to customers or consumers when they connect to the service. Or, or you could use a platform for it. But you need to make sure that you handle that part of the equation as well. It's not something that can be, can be forgotten about and isolated, OK? So that's all about uh, cryptography and making sure that we're, we're communicating with uh, our things in a way which is non-reputable, in a way which uh, can't be tampered with or, or eavesdropped upon. Strong thing identity. OK. Uh, I mentioned certificates already. OK, so these are the things, <laughs> the things, <laughs> the digital assets that are used to identify the things. There's too many things in this talk. It can get, get confusing. So I said before, X509 certificates, they're no different to the digital certificates that are used for HTTP, TLS, SSL connections, OK? You're going to uh, have your cert, which contains details about your entity, who you are. You're going to have your public key embedded within it. You're going to sign that with your private key. You're going to send it off for a certificate signing request, a CSR, with a certificate authority. That could be VeriSign. It could be your own certificate authority that you run. Uh, the certificate's going to come back signed, and at that point, you can use it. If you used it in a browser, you would see that uh, reassuring little padlock pop up in the bottom of the browser indicating that this connection was made using a signed certificate. In our model, that uh, verification process is an implicit component of allowing a connection to be established. So if you don't have a signed cert, and you don't have a root certificate associated with that signed cert available to you, then uh, all bets are off and you can't connect to our service endpoint. You should build the same thing if you're building this yourself. You want to use a trust route and you want to use a certificate authority to verify the identity of the devices by digitally signing these certificates that they use. That can be uh, quite a, an overhead, actually. I mean, talking about device prototyping, I've got a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or some other microcontroller sitting on my desk. I get my certificates, I get them signed, and I flash them onto the device, right? I do that over a USB cable or using an IDE that I have. It's so simple, isn't it? There's me and my device sitting next to me. Uh, of course, when you go into manufacturing, things get a lot more complicated. The devices aren't sitting next to me. They're in a semiconductor integration facility in Taiwan or in China somewhere. They're being built by a party that uh, maybe I don't trust, actually. Maybe I don't trust the party that is doing the building. Okay, so the, I've got to give my crypto materials, my public and private key, and my digital certificates to a third party. And my third party has to flash those cryptographic materials and those certificates onto my devices as part of their manufacturing process. Yeah, so I might have 50,000, 500,000, or 5 million of those things that are being built in that factory. How do I go about authorizing them for, for access. Uh, maybe it's not a great idea to authorize all of them. Yeah? So how do, how do I do that? The way we solve for that is you can register your own certificate authority, as I said before, to sign these certificates. Okay? So you could sign your own certs, give all of your certificates, all of your cryptographic materials to your manufacturing partner. The manufacturing partner receives a data dump that has all of that data in them, and they sequentially flash those onto the devices. Maybe they record the serial number of each device when they do that flashing, and they give you back a corresponding key value file which has serial numbers and the certificate IDs with it. Okay, so you know which serial number of device has which certificate on it. We support a feature called just-in-time registration of device certificates. This allows you to specify details of your certificate authority. Each time a certificate presents, which has been signed by that named certificate authority, we will create a policy and attach it to the new certificate. But we will put the certificate into an inactive state. Okay, so we know about it, but it's not active. It's not permitted to access our endpoint. You can then run an async process where you validate 
that the presented certificate matches a device, a serial number that's been registered or sold using an external source. And once you've done that, you can then activate that certificate. And that certificate and its private key will then become usable for connectivity to the platform. Okay, so you have a multi-stage registration process where whilst you've put your cryptographic materials into the hands of a, a party that you cannot necessarily trust 100%, those cryptographic materials aren't actually access, don't actually provide access to the platform. You have to go through an additional verification stage to switch that access on and allow those certs and crypto materials to be used for sending and receiving messages. Okay. So that's a good step to go through if you're building yourself to ensure that uh, only trusted devices are able to connect. We also support the simpler option, which is key pair generation and certificate generation for prototyping. And for that, you can just use a command line or click an option in our console, and we'll spit out the required cryptographic materials in the certificate, and you can get started in a few seconds, okay? But for production manufacturing, we wouldn't recommend that. We would recommend using this multi-stage process so you can verify that each client is authorized to connect before you authorize them to do so. Uh, by the way, that process that I've described there, that actually uses another AWS service called AWS Lambda in the background. So that registration process is actually serverless. You just write a function that activates the certificate on the basis of verification. You don't need to run infrastructure for that. We'll maybe talk about that offline if, if you're interested. So that's all about uh, the transport layer, really. It's about verifying who's connecting to me and ensuring that I've got appropriate cryptography in place to protect the traffic that they're sending to me and protect the traffic that I'm sending back. We haven't actually talked about any features yet. All we've talked about is getting the basic plumbing in place that allows you to send and receive data in a way which is trusted and secure, right? So let's move on and talk about fine-grained auth. And to talk about this, this is where I do have to talk about a bit more AWS specific, specific stuff because the fine-grained authorization uh, it kind of depends on what your features are, what other services you need to integrate your devices with in order to deliver the, the actual attributes of your product, your attributes of your service that you're building. So what, what we've talked about so far is all this, okay? So the device gateway, that's what your devices connect to. We have an authentication and authorization layer, which I just talked about, digital certificates. And then out on the devices, we have SDKs just to accelerate the development process, enable you to use some of this functionality at the back. But you can also use open source clients like uh, Eclipse Paho, which is the most widely used open source MQTT client, uh, because this gateway supports the MQTT protocol. Anybody not familiar with MQTT? Is that a new acronym to anybody in this room? Okay, so MQTT, it's developed by IBM in the early to mid 90s, message queue telemetry transport, gives a hint to which product group at IBM developed it more than anything else. It is a protocol for sending and receiving messages. So you can establish connectivity, you can send data through sockets, okay, and that data today is typically blocks of JSON that you would send. It's a pub-sub protocol that supports a logical construct called topics and also a topic hierarchy, okay? So uh, you can have a topic name which might be something like uh, application slash thermostats slash 105 or application slash chillers slash 104. And then I can subscribe to topics individually or subscribe to wildcard topics. So I could scribe, subscribe to all messages on application slash thermostats. I would get every message associated with any thermostat that had published a message on one of those topics. And correspondingly, I could, could subscribe to application slash chillers and get all the messages on there, or I could subscribe to specific devices by subscribing to specific serial numbers, okay? So it supports wildcarding in the topic. It's a very uh, lightweight protocol, uh, much, much more lightweight than HTTP, much less data is transmitted. It's much more terse in terms of its uh, syntax, protocol syntax, and it's much more power efficient, particularly when you use it over this mutual TLS auth. If you compare mutual TLS auth with MQTT to sending the same message via a HTTP post over SSL, you're looking at 180 times more power consumption for option two than you are for option one. So it's dramatically more power efficient, okay? That's why it's popular. We also do support HTTP here and we also support WebSockets as well. So you're not forced to use MQTT, but it's a very lightweight, efficient, 
uh, and cryptographically secure mechanism for connecting connected devices to a gateway. This doesn't have to be our gateway, by the way. You could do the same thing here with open source tools. This would be a project called Mosquito, which is an open source MQTT gateway. This would be a Paho MQTT client. The two things could still communicate. You could still subscribe systems at the back end to topics on your Mosquito gateway, and you could still build logic. Okay? The problem, the challenge with that is uh, horizontal scaling, which we heard about in the keynote. It can be quite difficult to do if you have a lot of messages. Okay, so you're going to have a lot of messages thrown through your gateway. Once you get beyond the limit that a single machine can handle at the back end, then you've got a distributed systems challenge that you need to work with. Concurrency, uh, message deduplication, lots of other issues that you've got to challenge, tackle, tackle. We do that in, in the platform. Okay? And then these other things. This allows you to inspect the contents of messages and route them on the basis of those contents. So say I got a message off one of my thermostats which says the temperature is now 61 degrees. Okay? I can have a rule which says select star from app slash thermostat slash where temperature is greater than 60 degrees. And then I can have actions associated with that rule. Push it to an endpoint and send a push notification to a mobile phone. Republish the message on another topic so that it switches on one of my chillers. Okay? And I can have multiple logical operations on each message that comes through my gateway. So I can build powerful message flows, message routing, just by using this rules engine. And this does scale completely elastically. So you get away from this distributed systems challenge with having to subscribe your own machines to MQTT topics and deal with concurrency management, failure management, scaling and security in that part of the architecture. So that's a service we have. And then on the device shadows, uh, this provides a virtual representation of device state, which is stored in, in the cloud in a document database. That means that I can asynchronously communicate with my devices. So my sheep that I mentioned earlier are a good example here. Maybe they're in a valley. When they go in a valley, maybe the line of sight radio on the collars doesn't work anymore. But every hour I want to check the status of my sheep. So how do I do that if I can't reach them? Well, if they publish their status to one of these shadows every 15 minutes when they're connected, I can connect to that shadow via an, another API, and I can read the state of those devices regardless of whether or not they're actually on the network. Okay, so a virtual representation of the device accessible via another web services API. And then shadow synchronization is called using methods that are implemented in this SDK here and that'll push device state back into the shadow. It actually uses MQTT to transport the device state into the shadow, so it's not another protocol, it's just more messaging on specific reserved topics. Okay? So again, that's something that can simplify the, the development process. The reason I'm talking about these is because we're gonna talk about applying policies to them. You could implement this in a different way if you wanted to build your own infrastructure. The, the concepts that I'm gonna describe would still apply, but you need to think about how you control where these messages are routed to, and also how you secure the process of pushing messages back down to devices. Okay, and our implementation is a good way to illustrate some thinking about that. So what do we have here? You know the difference between control plane and data plane? So the control plane is how we establish and manipulate the environment, okay? And the data plane is the messaging that flows within the environment in this context. Okay, so I can label my different resources. This is the control plane. This is our AWS IoT API. If I want to register a new device, authorize a digital certificate that's associated with a device. If I want to strip a digital certificate and deregister a device, I've got an API for that, which is the control plane for the overall service environment. That's represented there. The data plane on the device side, well, it's the MQTT gateway. I'm sending and receiving. Well, technically, I'm not sending, OK? The device is subscribed to topics, OK? So the device reads messages that are published on those topics. It's always a connection that goes from the device to the gateway, never the other way, OK? Uh, and I can publish on topics, and therefore messages will be read, or the device can publish on topics, and therefore this and this can read from those topics. Okay, that's how data flows through the gateway. Service access, it's to other AWS services, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the data plane, this is the back channel, so I want to write to the device. The data plane for that is exposed via the device shadow. So I make my state update. The SDK is subscribed to several MQTT topics, and through those subscriptions, 
the device is able to read the state change and modify its state to reflect the desired state, which is set in the shadow. Okay? So I need policy control here. What topics can I read and write from? Here, who is authorized to register devices, add policies, register and deregister certificates? Here, who is authorized to read and write data from a shadow? And here, where is my rules engine authorized to send data to in other AWS services? All make sense? Quite a lot of policy control points there, but it means that you have the ability to exercise fine-grained control over these different interfaces. So this is about permissions for thing management. So here we're talking about this, okay, the control plane. And uh, I have policy language that I can use. Now in my case, in the AWS case, the policy language is defined using our IAM policies. Okay, so we have an identity and access management service. You could build something yourself, similar if you were implementing this yourself. Okay? So we have, here you'll see policy language like action, IoT, update certificate, and there's an allow statement and a resource star. So a principal to whom this policy is applied has the capability to update, create, and modify certificates. Okay? And over here, you'll see how we can actually exercise more fine-grained control. Here, I'm giving uh, a, a principle, the capability to revoke a single thing by doing an update certificate on a specific named resource, which is a specific certificate from a particular source address. So you can scope down the policies to fine-grained granular control over who can do what. On the data plane on the device side, you can do something similar. Here I've got another, another policy which I'm applying uh, actually to every resource in my no, namespace and I'm allowing publishing, subscription and receive to specific topics. So once again I can scope down the connectivity and permit specific devices to communicate only with specific topics that are required for their function. It'd be like locking down all of my thermostats and allowing them only to publish to the thermostat topic. Okay? Or maybe to the one associated with their specific device serial number. I can really scope in and, and, and lock down uh, what's available to me. Okay? I won't go into a lot more on this, but you just need to establish those control points in your particular architecture and make sure that you're able to tightly scope for a principle of least privilege around those control points. So last thing to talk about, uh, hardware security. There are quite a few different things here. So... Uh, the attack surface on the devices themselves needs to be minimized to the greatest extent possible. Okay? This is why microcontrollers are quite a good option, because they just don't have unnecessary services and functionality built into them. They run a single process, and that process is your IoT process. Okay? So they don't have a web server, they don't have anything else that you might not want running on there. If you do insist on using Linux, then SE Linux and use of Chiru and other features that can scope down the capabilities of the operating system, of course, hardening the operating system. It's so important that it could be the whole topic for this talk, really. So just use the minimum device footprint that you can in terms of software and really lock down the device so that if you do have to expose it to the internet or to anything that's untrusted, really you can minimize the attack surface there to the greatest extent you can. That's very, very important. Then you've got some other considerations because untrusted individuals may have access to your hardware. Now, I'm selling these devices. It might be reverse engineering by somebody that wants to steal my software or hardware designs. It might be something more uh, malignant than that. You know, it might be trying to subvert my overall system by breaching the hardware. And, and for that, there are things like uh, trusted platform modules that you can use where you establish a cryptographic route in hardware on the device and that cryptographic route is used for decrypting file systems and, uh, and unpacking the device, so that if the device is disassembled and, it's tried and, and someone tries to use it in a location where the cryptographic route is not available, so maybe reading your flash storage via an external reader to try and steal your IP, for example, or get your keys, because they disconnect it from the cryptographic route when they do that, all they get is white noise on the device. So there are techniques like that you can use. Also, uh, things like IoT gateways, as I mentioned earlier, they can remove the requirement for you to talk IP out at this side, and you've got many of the protocols that you can use, like LoRaWAN and others, radio protocols, non-IP protocols that can be good on this side, very low power, often very low range, but it can be a good fit for things like home gateways, uh, device automation, industrial use cases where you're equipping a, fa a factory maybe with sensors. So lots that can be done on gateways. This is an example of one of these cryptographic root devices, one of these uh, 
hardware verification systems that uses crypto. It's manufactured by somebody called Amtel. This one actually is designed specifically to work with AWS IoT, so it deals with X509 certificates using a hardware route, a trusted route certificate that is stored in hardware. It's quite an interesting device. Uh, you can just Google Amtel Zero Touch Secure Provisioning if you're interested in that. They cost less than a dollar, and they're something that you would integrate into each manufactured device that you built and that would give you a very high level of hardware security and also a secure location to store your crypto certs and your private keys on the device which aren't on flash. They're actually embedded in the, in the zero touch provisioning kit. It's pretty cool. Okay, so last takeaway. Okay, and then we'll maybe have a bit of time for some questions maybe. If you spend a lot of time securing your IoT applications, you're not spending time solving problems for customers. Okay, so this is my sort of one sale slide. Okay, so this is the takeaway. If you're building a platform for IoT, then you should focus all of your effort on building a platform. If your intent is actually to build applications and services for users, then focus your time on building applications and services for users and rely on a platform which already solves these problems, okay? There's quite, we've talked about quite a lot of stuff there. We're barely scratching the surface of these topics in an hour. We could spend days going into this stuff in, in more detail and teaching you how to use it. So avoid that if you can. If you want to build a, a wearable, if you want to build a smart home, if you want to build a module for a connected car, choose a platform which already has security built into it. It could be ours, it could be another, and try to avoid doing it yourself. If you're a security pro, pro and you can build a strong, capable platform like this, then just build the platform, okay? And build it on us or compete with us, but focus on that and, and don't try and span both domains. Don't try and build a product that services users and a platform that services developers at the same time. It probably won't end well because you can't focus on both of those things to the extent that you should. Okay, that's my talk. <laughs>